Hello there, Market Insights watchers. Well, in Market Roundup, the latest job numbers and Fed rate cut probabilities are on the table. Uh, see what it means for your stocks. And tech mega trends. Well, we're showing where the 2024 investing trends are and giving you three stocks that we are recommending today. And in Crypto Corner, Ian will answer your hot topic crypto questions, as well as a Zeitgeist type of interesting information in a crypto market and share uh, details on what's happening in this digital financial market. Of course, while you're here, remember to like and subscribe this Banyan Hill YouTube channel. We appreciate your support. So let's get to it. Hi, Ian. Hello. How are you today? I'm good. Where's Alex, Amber? Alex is on the other side of the door. And I hear him okay. bark because he's playing with one of his toys. Big, okay. Big toys, Big Red. Don't ask me why. And that is All where right. he is. But he's around. <laughs> Hopefully so, he makes an appearance next week. I'm sure all our viewers are missing him. I know. I will get him into his chair eventually. <laughs> But yeah. Ian, before we jump into Market Roundup, I have to share that they, we have a special crypto event coming your way, Market Insights watchers. It will be on Tuesday, March 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Ian is going live with an event he's calling the fourth halving, and he'll be revealing the profit pattern he uncovered from studying Bitcoin's prior halvings, as well as three factors that give lesser known cryptos 10,000% potential in a year after any Bitcoin halving event. And Ian, in my opinion, and all of our opinion, is easily the top crypto expert out there. Yes, you are, Ian. And his top trade during the last halving actually resulted in two, yes, two windfalls. The first was over 3,900% in three months, and the second was 18,000% in a year. So to sign up for this event, uh, please see the link in the email accompanying this video or the link in the YouTube description page below. So now for Market Roundup. Well, well I have to thank you for that little hype there, Amber, by the way. Anytime, Ian. And, and I just want to mention, you know, what's really interesting is like, you know, there's Bitcoin and Ethereum. I'm sure you've seen those rallies. Mm -hmm. You know, Bitcoin, I think, is up. 4x now in the last eight months or so ethereum is up is about tripled but what happens is there are actual crypto assets beyond bitcoin and ethereum that move even more when you have these big moves in bitcoin and ethereum so that's what we're going to talk about on the webinar make sure you please sign up oh yes please do we look forward to seeing you there all so right Yes, in market roundup, uh, 275,000 jobs were added in February, which is an uptick from a revised downward January's payroll of 229,000, and still stronger than Jerome Powell's estimated neutral pace of around 100,000 uh, positions jobs. So jobs gains in February were mostly in two sectors, healthcare services and government as these two sectors are not really, uh, I could say, affected or sensitive to downturns. Uh, the unemployment rate unexpectedly rose to 3.9% from 3.7% prior reading, and wage growth was cooler than expected at 0.1%. Now, traders see softness in the employment data, firmly believing that we'll see at least three interest rate cuts this year. Uh, meanwhile, though February's Institute of Supply Management or ISM index, which is a key indicator that gauges the state of the US economy, it calculates the level of demand for products uh, by measuring uh, the amount of ordering activity at the nation's factories. Well, this index actually remained in expansion territory coming in at 52.6. The employment sub-indexes in ISM showed hiring contracted or cooled. Uh, the employment sub-index actually fell to 48 versus 50.5 prior, and a print above 50, as I mentioned, indicates expansion. So this indicates the Fed's tightening cycle is working. And speaking of Fed Chair Jerome Powell, Ian, um, he made headlines last week suggesting rate cuts may soon be on the horizon. Uh, Mr. Powell suggested the Fed Reserve is getting closer uh, to start lowering interest rates. Uh, he said, quote, we are waiting to become more confident that inflation is moving sustainably at 2%. Uh, when we do get that confidence and we're not far from it, it will be appropriate to begin to dial back the level of restriction, end quote. 
So as a result of uh, this talk, of, of all this talk, stocks climbed higher, hitting all-time highs as investors bet interest rate cuts may soon, uh, may soon actually begin as soon as June of this year. The probability for a Fed rate cut in June now stands at 67.9%, up from 62% last week. So a little bit more, just a little teeny <laughs> tiny bit more, you know, 62 to 67. Yeah, is a there. A little, little, little calibration. So what do you think, Ian? What are your thoughts on all these numbers? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, that's a lot uh, of information to digest. Thank you for all that. I think the, the big news is basically that wage growth is slowing. So, you know, we were expecting 0.2% wage growth. We got 0.1%. Um, the, the market likes it. It's up today. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're also seeing interest rates come down. So the 10-year the note at one point was at 4.3%, and now it's down to 4.08%. Mm -hmm. um, and so- you know, there was a little bit of a worry, I think, because remember at one point we were below four to begin this year, we were about 3.8%. Right. And then we climbed to like 4.35%. There was a little worry we we're going to go back to 5%. Mm. But you're seeing um, interest rates come back down. You know, it's it, what's really interesting about this, Amber, is that it feels like the market is already like pricing in interest rate cuts this year, it, you know? It really is, yes. Um, not only are we seeing like big mega cap tech stock that has gone up, but but some of them have come down, but you know, obviously NVIDIA, which is just its own monster. Mm -hmm. But when you look at crypto, some of the speculative excess that's happening in crypto um, around these meme coins mm -hmm. uh, is usually indicative of, you know, zero is something you see at zero interest rates, right? So mm -hmm. what is crypto going to do when the Fed actually starts cutting? You know, like Bitcoin at an all, all time high and interest rates, the Fed funds rates are above 5%. Mm -hmm. Where is Bitcoin going to be when the Fed cuts to 2%, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think there's going to be more money printing out there and easy money, then the hard assets start to rally, right? So gold and now Bitcoin, which has been acting as a store of value. Right. And I think it's pricing in, you know, Fed cuts already and, and potentially could go a lot higher from here because of the Fed cutting. I also think... Other piece of news this week that uh, people might be familiar with is the thing that happened in New York Community Bank Corp, right? So you had basically a bank that got in trouble with commercial real estate. It's a small, maybe a canary in the coal mine, mm -hmm. but it. I think the market has actually responded to it in the same way that happened with Silicon Valley last year. Remember, Silicon Valley Bank got in trouble last year because they loaded up their balance sheets with U.S. Treasury bonds when rates were really low. Rates went up, the value of those bonds went down. They got in a situation where they had to take big markdowns on U.S. government bonds, and the Fed basically stepped in and said, "Hey, you know, your the your the whole your holdings might be trading at sixty cents on the dollar, but if you give them back to us, we'll give you a hundred. Hmm. And so it was effectively a bailout of a lot of regional banks. Um, and at the time, because that signaled the Fed is basically loosening credit or loosening money, the market rallied in March. Mm -hmm. This New York Community Bank Court might be, you know, indicative of the same situation where. The Fed has already stepped in, helped out New York Community Bank Corp. There could be other banks that are in dip, having tough times with commercial real estate. But I think the moral of the story is, is like the banks get in trouble with commercial real estate. That's been kind of a boogeyman that people are worried about. But now we know how the Fed's going to respond to anything that's a bigger crisis, right? Yes. They, they're basically stand ready and they, they jump right in. So this idea of a Fed put, which means that basically the market can't drop uh, significantly because the Fed will always issue bailout and, and make money easier is still in effect. Mm -hmm. Um and and I think you know that is that that is a sign that the market is probably ready to go higher as well. On and if we're in this we're in this part where it's like the slowdown is actually good news because the Fed's going to cut, right? If we had job growth which wasn't as strong as it is this month, mm -hmm. you know, or you see the PMIs turning down, like that's positive. That means the Fed is more likely to cut this year and that's going to be good for the market or in the market's already starting to price that in. Mm -hmm. Perfect. That's I agree with that wholeheartedly there, Ian. Okay, so let's talk about tech megatrends. So 2024 is shaping up to be the year, of course, of artificial intelligence, AI adjacent uh, positions and stocks, as well as innovative health uh, type themes. Now, themes in weight loss drugs and health and fitness, semiconductors and AI are showing tremendous resilience with all three maintaining a top five spot in Bloomberg Intelligence uh, ranking uh, system. Actually, this is over year to date as well as one year return analysis. 
And these themes are, quote, outpacing the S&P 500 across both time horizons. Uh, investors' focus is firmly planted on AI, AI-adjacent, and innovative health, end quote. So if you're a subscriber to Strategic Fortunes, True Momentum, or even, of course, Extreme Fortunes, then you'll know we are already invested with our members in these themes. For example, for weight loss drugs, we recommended Alt Immune Ticker ALT to True Momentum subscribers last June of 23. Uh, they're up about 191% on this trade. And in Strategic Fortune, subscribers are up about 373% on AMD, our semiconductor trade, and 62% on Palantir since it was just record in January. January of this year as Ian's number one stock for 2024. So if you're not yet part of any of these services, we'd love to have you join the family. Uh, please check out ways to join in the email that accompanies this video uh, for all those details. So yep, Ian, we're in the themes, AI, health, wellness, all that and, and above, semis. Lots of, lots of megatrends. Mm -hmm. And we don't own NVIDIA in, in the model portfolio, no. but we do own one of its close rivals. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people recently have been making the analogy between what's happening with NVIDIA now and what happened with networking stocks during mm -hmm. dot-com. So I don't know if you remember Cisco. I mean, it's still a public company. Cisco oh, yeah. and Lucent. Mm -hmm. I actually went back and I, I looked at what Lucent's valuation was in 2000. Mm -hmm. It was trading at 100 times earnings, right? Mm -hmm. NVIDIA is only trading at 27 times next year's earnings. Wow. So like the company is going, moving up, but it's also growing revenues and earnings at a scale that is absolutely unfathomable. Mm -hmm. Just in the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. NVIDIA added like the, a market cap of Tesla to the company, you know, um, like we've never seen a company that's growing revenues and earnings and market cap as fast as NVIDIA in the history of the stock market. And the reason this is happening is basically there's an AI arms race right now. So every large tech company, whether Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Google, which they're all flush with cash mm -hmm. and they need to buy compute power. And mm -hmm. who's going to sell it to you? NVIDIA and also AMD, yep. uh, the two, two main suppliers. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing to keep in mind here is that this is a competitive market. And so if Microsoft, which owns ChatGPT, is outpaced by Google, right? When Google's AIs haven't done that well, or or Meta, let's say, which is the old Facebook, uh, this is a winner take all scenario, right? So the the one AI that that emerges from this is going to be similar to like how Google controls search engines, right? Or how Microsoft controls Office, mm -hmm. because the more people using it makes these models better, and that's why all these companies are racing to basically buy as much compute power as they can. And they're all flush with cash. Yeah. And so, you know, th that that is what's driving AI and it's gonna come faster than we expect because of how much spending is happening to it. Oh, yes, it's really mind boggling how quickly this is turning around and turning out. We oh. might be avatars right now. I mean, I don't even know. Are we in a, <laughs> are we in a simulation, Amber, or is this real no. life? Oh, no, I don't even know anymore. <laughs> We're still real life people. <laughs> but who knows what happens in the future. Okay, let's turn to Crypto Corner. Ian, we have a couple of questions that come in. I know you have some really good information to share as well. So you let me know what you want to cover first. So a couple of things, because because I just uh, talked about AI, I want to I want to just mention there was a deal that happened this week. And, um, you know, the, the two biggest megatrends right now is in my mind are like, how is cryptocurrency disrupting traditional markets? And number two, what's going on with AI? Mm -hmm. Now, there was a capital raise for a company this week um, that's a, a basically a crypto company that is the convergence of AI and crypto. Now, hear me out. Mm -hmm. So you have basically uh, compute power on one side, right? With GPUs. So you build a data center, you create all these GPUs, and then another company writes the AI or the algorithm, and it needs these GPUs. Mm -hmm. crypto and there's a bunch of protocols doing this one just raised capital at at they raised 30 million dollars the valuation was in the hundreds of millions mm. crypto can actually create this market in gpus so let's say you have a program that's running 
and you need more to buy more GPUs. Well, the blockchain can keep track of who has GPUs to sell and who wants to buy it. And it can be doing it automatically, algorithmically, and it can be controlled by a crypto token. There are a number of projects, one in specifically that we own in the Next Wave Crypto Fortunes portfolio uh, that's done really well from us for us that that actually does this. It manages the market in GPUs. So, you know, you can basically create a much more efficient market this way where it's not only going to be Microsoft and Facebook and Google and also, you know, sovereign countries are building their own AI systems. Anyone can raise capital, go build their own data centers and then sell their GPU to the market using essentially the blockchain and a crypto token that can govern this. So I think that is probably the biggest story right now is how AI is colliding with blockchain to manage these markets for GPUs. And, you know, I've always said, Amber, it's like when the machines rise up, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think they're going to be transacting in fiat currency? <laughs> no, no, no. Cryptocurrency yeah. is a way for two economic actors to exchange some type of economic value for one another mm -hmm. without a centralized entity on top of it. Okay. So the Bitcoin came about because it was a peer to peer network of value transfer, right? I send you Bitcoin and there's not a, there's no bank in the middle that is determining whether or not my send to you is valid and whether or not you've received it. There's a decentralized network. So nobody has control of the whole network. Now, the last thing I want to say about crypto this week, and I just want to share this cartoon with everybody because we've all seen prices going to new highs, Ethereum and Bitcoin, Solana obviously is back around 150. Just check out this cartoon. Mm -hmm. This is just the zeitgeist of crypto right now. When Bitcoin's at 25,000, nobody cares. It gets to 65,000 and everybody rushes in. And I've seen this happen over and over again in every cycle, but I just want to say it's also not too late to get involved in crypto because when we hit a new high, especially in Bitcoin, and it drives the whole cycle, everything come, goes along with it. And we've seen this happen again and again. In 2016, the halving cycle, Amber, mm -hmm. uh, $1,000 was like the line in the sand. It got through $1,000. Next stop was like $10,000, $20,000 by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. In 2020 halving cycle, we mm -hmm. got back to $20,000. When we passed $20,000, it went basically in a straight line up to you know, $69,000. Mm. We're we're right there at the old high. And that means in my mind that we're probably going to go to six digits sometime, likely in the, the, the closer future that everybody anticipates. Because what happens is when you have a major breakout in cryptocurrencies, you have people that have been buying this and accumulating it and sitting through a bear market for a couple of years, like my subscribers have. And now you're not going to sell for a 20 or 30% gain, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. you're going to hold it. Yeah. At the same time, you have people rushing in mm. with demand to buy. Like we mentioned last week, there's 9,000. The ETFs have 9,000 new Bitcoins to buy every day, and the miners are only making 900 of them a day, right? So you have to find that supply somewhere. It usually comes when you have higher prices. But the fact is that people who have been holding Bitcoin through the bear market are not inclined to sell for a 50 or 100% gain. They're expecting the same type of gains that we saw in 2016 and 2020, which is going to make this market go further and faster than everybody thinks, but it is not an easy market to trade, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're going to see days where crypto climbs 20, 30% and days where it drops 20, 15%. So you just have to make sure that you have a proper allocation in your portfolio that you're comfortable with and understand the risk that we face ahead because we are heading into basically uncharted waters in the crypto market. And, you know, I, I my belief it's, it's going to go up very, very quickly, uh, but it is also going to be very difficult to trade. Right. Of Just course. case in point, I say this over and over again. Mm -hmm. 2017, you had a bull market in Bitcoin. It right. went up from 1,000 to 20,000. 20 20x, 20x. Within that 20x move, there were seven pullbacks of 20% or more, mm -hmm. right? Three of them were 30%. So imagine if you bought Bitcoin at 5,000, Okay. And let's say you put ten ten thousand dollars into Bitcoin when it was five thousand. You know what happened three weeks later in the summer of twenty seventeen, Amber? It went to three thousand mm -hmm. and then it went to twenty. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, what happens is people get shaken out. Mm -hmm. I just don't want them I don't want to see that happen. So I always advise buy it after you see people panicking during these bull markets, because you're gonna have these days like we had last week where people panicked and sold. 
and then you'll be good. You know, just be very careful where you where you enter. Of course. Oh, you can hear more of it on Next Wave Crypto Fortune. So please, please sign up for our webinar. Mm -hmm, definitely. All right. Okay. So we have a couple of questions, Ian, if you're ready for those. Um, okay. Yes. We, the first is from Ray. Hello, Ray. Thanks for writing in. Ray says, hi, Ian. Is there an ETF Bitcoin fund that you like? I want to invest in Bitcoin without buying the coin. Thank you for your time for this request. Long time member. Awesome. I, I like the BlackRock fund, Amber, ticker symbol IBIT. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have it in the model portfolio. We would prefer you own regular Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But if you can't because you want to put it in a retirement account, and a lot of retirement accounts don't let you own real Bitcoin, you can buy the BlackRock fund. And I would stick with the ones that have the most liquidity. Um, because there, at some point in this market, it's always true. You know, there's a significant downturn. The less liquid Bitcoin ETFs mm -hmm. uh, are going to have a hard time supporting all the selling, right? So, let's say you have, um, you know, the BlackRock fund, and I, I, this is a hypothetical. This is my belief. It's, it doesn't necessarily have to happen in practice. But let's say you have the BlackRock fund, mm -hmm. which has more volume than you know one of these uh, smaller ETFs that 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 have come out recently. If you see a sharp sell-off in Bitcoin, let's say it goes down 20 or 30% one day, the ETF, the BlackRock ETF might drop the same amount, but some of the other ETFs might drop 50 or 60%. Mm. So, you know, that that that's what you have to be mindful of. And I think that there's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy to like the funds that have the most volume, more people buy them. So they actually become more stable and more liquid over time. Mm -hmm. uh, even though, you know, there's 11 other options right now, but I would just say go buy the BlackRock fund. Okay. All right. Uh, Candy's written in. Hello, Candy. Uh, thank you for all your videos and recommendation. Really helpful. I have a question on crypto. What is the correct strategy for selling Bitcoin and Ethereum? And, and Candy also goes on to write, I understand you suggested reallocation of our portfolio percentage when our portfolio is growing more than what we target at. So if we sell Bitcoin when it hits 100,000 and buy it back 20% less, if we do have a correction, what happens if there is no co correction? What should we do? Similar question for- If there's no correction and we go like, let's say straight to $200,000 Bitcoin and you're already involved, congratulations. I mean- okay. I would just say, well, first of all, Candy, thank you for the question. And, you know, that's why we have been basically, I've been like pounding my head against this wall for like the last year. Uh, and and I knew you have too, Amber, just telling people, it doesn't matter what your allocation is, just have an allocation to it. It could be 3%, 5%. Some of you out there that like to take more risk, 10%, 20%, just have to be in it. Okay. Now, as the crypto market starts moving, like we saw in 2016 and 2020, it's going to become a larger part of your portfolio. It's just what happens because everybody else wants in now too. Of so my rule of thumb is let's say you you had 5% of your portfolio in it and then it's 15%. Well, you know, like we said, Amber, you're on the bus to California. You're going to get off at Chicago. <laughs> oh, maybe you don't want to go to California, right? You're on the bus from New York to Florida. You're going to get off in North Carolina. No, uh, maybe even North Carolina is kind of nice, isn't it? You go to Asheville in the mountains, no? Mm -hmm. um, so no, I mean, you don't want to get off the bus on the way to its final destination. However, we have to be mindful of, you know, overweighting too much in your portfolio. So I think just like kind of a heuristic, like rule of thumb, again, I'm not a financial advisor, so I don't know like everyone's specific. Mm -hmm. If you invested 5% and it's 15 or 20%, you don't have to go back to 5%. You can go to like 12%, but it's just important that you trim on the way up, right? If you see any of these huge spikes in Bitcoin, let's say a month from now, we're at 100,000. Mm -hmm. Markets, by the way, don't like round numbers. So like when we get to like 100,000, it's more likely we're going to hit 100,000 and then trade back to like 80 or 75,000, right? Mm -hmm. It's like that round number that the markets don't like. And then we'll have like a period of consolidation underneath that big number before we actually take it out again. So, you know, I I, I would say just look at your portfolio. We you start with five and now it's 15 or 20% of your, your total investment holdings. Just trim the tree a little bit. Just, you know, put some in the bank. I wouldn't say like don't sell Bitcoin and then reallocate into Ethereum or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Just move it into something that's like more stable after you've taken a big gain in it is, is, mm -hmm. is my view. And, and also it, it's, it's everyone's perspective. So, you know, you might be 25 years old and, and can hold for 20 years. So you don't really care if it drops 50% in the next year, but there will be a bear market in the future. 
you just got to make sure that you've sold enough in the bull market that you can start reallocating into the bear market as well. So I don't know if that helped you out, Candy. Sorry. That's just like the, the way I do it. There's no like set in stone way. It's more just about how much risk you're comfortable taking. And you just understand like if something is 20% of your portfolio, it goes down 50%, you're going to lose 10% of your portfolio. So look at your total number and, and figure out whether or not you, or you're okay losing that much in something risky. Mm. Okay, there. And thank you for answering Candy's question. Thank you, Ray and Candy, for writing in. And if you do have a if you do have a question for us to address in next week's webinar, please email us at marketinsights at banninghill.com. So that's awesome. it for this week, Ian. Yeah. Thanks, Amber. That was that was fun. Thanks sure. everyone for watching, and we'll talk to you next week. Take care. Be safe out there. Bye-bye. <laughs>